Great. Hi, everybody. Um, so it, it's nice to, to be able to talk to everyone and welcome to um, the continuation of Cell Press Physical Science Week um, and our webinar today on light matter interaction. So I'm Stacy Chin, I'm one of the editors at Matter, and I'm moderating with uh, Michelle Muzio, one of the editors from iScience. Um, we're very excited to have you all here and looking forward to the presentations today. Um, so each presenter will talk for about 20 minutes and be, and then we'll have time to field a few questions. And um, But in particular, we chose these speakers not only because they have awesome science, but because they are also known as strong mentors that are engaged and advocate within the scientific community. So after their presentations, we will um, have a panel discussion where um, we'll be able to ask them audience questions about their life outside of research and especially how they've adapted and are working within the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So our first speaker today is Leah Ninehouse from Florida State University. After her graduate work with Professor Grubel at UIUC and a postdoc at MIT with Minju Gowendi, Leah began her independent career as an assistant professor at FSU in 2018. So her group pioneers the application of bulk perovskite sensitizers um, in photon upconversion and understanding their photophysics. Leah is also an active contributor to hashtag Fluorescence Fridays on Twitter, um, which shares uh, pictures of the glowing nanoparticles that her group makes. Um, we're really excited to have her share her work today. Um, and so we can start the presentation and take it away. Hopefully. All right. Okay. Um, Leah, you can. Yep. Thank you for the introduction. Um, with the te technical difficulties here, this might get interesting, but um, I'd like to start out by introducing uh, glowy things, which pretty much encompasses anything uh, that fluoresces. And we're going to span the range from lab to kitchen. Next slide, please. Sure. Um, so the research in the Neenhouse lab is overall um, geared towards understanding light matter interaction at the nanoscale. So we're particularly interested in upconversion, uh, glowy things. So pretty much anything that emits light, uh, we can do something with. And uh, mo more recently, we're getting into science communication. Um, so the two um, main approaches that we use to understand light matter interaction is uh, first of all, scanning tunneling microscopy. And uh, in particular, it's scanning tunneling microscopy coupled with optics. So any sort of laser or light excitation plus the scanning tunneling microscope. And we also work on uh, optical spectroscopy. So we work with steady state photoluminescence where you simply excite your sample and then uh, run the emitted light through a monochromator and then onto a detector. So you get a spectrum of all of the colors that are emitted. Uh, and we also do time correlated single photon counting um, where essentially you histogram photon arrival times um, and you get a lifetime from your sample. Next slide. Um, so I'd like to start out by introducing upconversion uh, and two types of upconversion in particular. So the first one would be green to blue upconversion. Um, so upconversion in general is the combination of two or more low energy photons to create one higher energy photon. <laughs> Uh, so in this case, we take two green photons and turn it into one blue photon. Uh, and there are some applications for this, in particular, <laughs> photocatalysis. Um, you can also do infrared to visible upconversion, uh, where in this case, you take two infrared photons and combine them to uh, one visible photon and uh, obvious uh, applications for this would be uh, increasing the efficiency of solar cells by um, harvesting more of the solar light. So you can see the uh, solar spectrum here and there's a significant region of light that cannot be accessed by common photovoltaics nowadays. Another interesting application would be the infrared sensitization of silicon for uh, imaging, so fog greatly scattered visible light. So down here uh, on the right, you can see uh, the Golden Gate Bridge on a typical day uh, through a visible camera and through a shortwave infrared uh, camera. And you can see that in the shortwave infrared, you can clearly see through the fog. 
and uh, looking towards the development of self-driving cars is actually could be interesting moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, the app conversion occurs through triplet triplet annihilation. So I'd like to start out by introducing uh, what a singlet and what a triplet state even is. So in a singlet state, your electrons are anti-parallel. So you have one spin up electron and one spin down electron. In a triplet, your uh, electron spins are parallel. So all of our ground states are always uh, singlet states. And upon absorption of a photon, you excite to a higher lying state. Um, the triplet state, however, would require um, not just the excitation to a higher lying state, but also the spin flip. Uh, and this is a forbidden transition due to selection rules, and therefore triplets are uh, optically inaccessible because you'd have to excite to a high lighting state and do the spin flip at the same time. And um, therefore, I'm sorry, <laughs> we can't uh, really access these very well. So, yes, moving on. <laughs> um, the EP conversion occurs through a process called triplet-triplet annihilation. And so what we do is we take advantage of non-emissive and very long-lived states and polyacenes. So a lot of carbon, a lot of hydrogen, and a lot of double bonds. And so what happens in this EP conversion process is that two anti-correlated triplets interact without a forbidden spin flip. So essentially you take one spin up triplet, one spin down triplet, and in the end you get one higher lying singlet state and a ground state. And that's just a little animation. And now that you're back up in the singlet state, essentially you can relax back down to the ground state upon the emission of a photon. And so the big question is how do we access uh, the triplet state and more importantly, how do we access it efficiently? So since this is a forbidden transition, uh, you only have a very, very, uh, weak transition dipole moment to get into the state. So you need a lot of energy or a lot of light uh, to be able to get into the state. And that doesn't seem very useful in particular if you're trying to do this under solar uh, fluences. And so what you do um, is you take advantage of triplet sensitizers. So initially people use uh, metal organic complexes. So, um, Intersystem crossing, so the transition from a singlet to a triplet state, is enhanced in the presence of heavy metals. So if you take a metal organic complex, you can easily transition between singlet and the triplet state. Um, more recently, quantum dots were used and nanoplatelets or bulk perovskites. So the quantum dot has the benefit that its exciton has both singlet and triplet character. Um, so that means you can easily do energy transfer from this um, exciton to the triplet state of whatever organic material you're using. And then once the energy is in the triplet state, <clears throat> it can undergo triplet triplet annihilation and create uh, your higher energy singlet state. Um, and then you can also use perovskites as a uh, sensitizer. So there has been research geared towards nanocrystals as well as bulk perovskite films as uh, triplet sensitizers. Okay, so I'm gonna start out with green to blue uh, up conversion. And so in particular, we're doing this with cad selenide um, nanomaterials. So one of the big issues with uh, these little nanomaterials is that they have these long uh, spaghetti-like ligands on them. And uh, these hinder efficient transfer of the exciton due to the fact that this triplet exciton transfer or TUT is exponentially dependent on the distance between your donor and your acceptor. So with that, we use transmitter ligands instead of doing the triplet transfer directly from um, our quantum dot to whatever up conversion material we're using. In this case, it would be diphenylanthracene. So in this case, it's a energy transfer cascade where you go first to the transmitter ligand and then uh, you create the triplet state on our diphenylanthracene. And since we're doing this in solution, if another excited 
diphenyl adenosine um, collides with this uh, molecule, you can get up conversion. Okay, so we were now interested in moving uh, from the zero dimensional quantum dots, so spherical quantum dots, to two dimensional uh, nanoplatelets. And using <laughs> sensitizers. Next slide. Um, in particular, we were interested in using them due to the fact that there is no energetic polydispersity in nanoplatelets, so therefore they have narrow line widths. Um, they have giant oscillator strengths, and it's been shown that you can have rapid exciton migration um, in films or aggregates of these platelets, and we thought this could be fairly interesting to look at. Um, we've found 5.4% upconversion efficiency at this point. However, the quantum dots are still at 16%. Um, and one of the main reasons we're seeing a reduced upconversion efficiency with the nanoplatelets is that there is stacking of the nanoplatelets due to strong Fanerol's interaction. So there's, these are extended materials and therefore they like to stack. And there's two types of stacking. Next slide, please. Um, you can either have stacking before you even try to add your transmitter ligand, which you can see here on the right. And with that, many sites where the transmitter ligand could bind to just are accessible. On the left, uh, you see stacking after uh, exchange with this transmitter ligand. And then you can imagine that you have um, transmitter ligands that are buried in this stack and therefore are not uh, TET active. So they just can't um, funnel their energy uh, out to the up converter itself. So our current research directions here are essentially we're trying to reduce stacking. We're trying to make a efficient solid state device. And we're also looking into other dimensionalities. And one of the most interesting thing of using uh, these two dimensional nanoplatelets is the fact that essentially because there's a direction, you could think about um, making polarization dependent uh, devices or switches. Um, okay, so changing gears a little bit, uh, moving to infrared to visible up conversion. So uh, my postdoc was mostly focused on quantum dot based up conversion. And the one issue that we ran into was that a monolayer of quantum dots seemed to be pretty much the best that you could do. And this is caused by poor exciton diffusion. So these long organic ligands that you have around the quantum dots just don't let the exciton uh, wander very far in, in a thick um, quantum dot film. And therefore, we could only get less than 1% absorption. And so if your absorption is less than 1%, that also sets an upper limit of any up conversion efficiency to roughly half a percent. Um, so that's where perovskite based up conversion comes in. And our current benchmark is about 60% absorption. Um, so I was inspired by two things to do this work. Um, first of all, there are reports of a subband gap onset of rubrine uh, emission in OLEDs. And so this indicates that the triplet state could be directly excited by charge injection. And the other reason I was inspired to use perovskites is they appear to be better at pretty much anything than most other materials have been in the past. And so why not give it a try? And so our hypothesis was that any material with an appropriate band alignment could actually act as a triplet sensitizer. Now I'd like to introduce the perovskites. Um, so perovskites have been a hot topic for pretty much the last decade due to their unprecedented increases in solar cell efficiencies. So a perovskite, uh, it's just an ABX3 structure um, named after calcium titanate. Um, so A, is a divalent cation, commonly lead or tin. B is a monovalent uh, cation, where you use cesium or the organics, methylammonium or formamidinium. And X is a halide anion. 
Um, conveniently, your properties are, of course, composition dependent, so you can tune the band gap based on your composition. Uh, perovskites generally have long free carrier lifetimes, um, which essentially will allow our charges to live long enough to be extracted. They show high absorption cross sections and they're very easily solution fabricated. Um, so in our case here, we're doing uh, methyl ammonium formamidinium lead triiodide uh, perovskites, which we name MAFA for convenience. And our up converter is rubrine, just a tetracine derivative. It's a common up converter. Um, here, top left, you can see the general device structure. Um, the idea is that upon 780 nanometer uh, excitation, you get either emission from the perovskite, or you can see the upconverted uh, light emitted around 600 uh, nanometers. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see our devices. So we went into um, the thickness dependence of the up conversion, and we saw that roughly a hundred nanometer thick film is actually the best. Uh, there's a trade-off between um, efficiency and reabsorption here. And so the idea here is that you excite the perovskite, so you create free carriers, you have a hole in the valence band and electrons in the conduction band, and you do hole transfer and uh, electron transfer to the triplet state of berberine. Next slide. Um, we spent some time looking at this interface because it seemed to be not quite as trivial as we hoped it would be initially. Um, so what you can see here is essentially the energetics of the valence band and the conduction band and the HOMO and the LUMO of uh, both our perovskite and the rubrine when they're not in, in contact. So next, um, if you bring them into contact and uh, consider the fact that this is an N-type perovskite and a P-type organic, um, of course, they don't just stay the way they are and uh, you don't just have contact and the bands stay exactly the way they are. Rather, what happens is that, next. <laughs> um, essentially, your charges move around a little bit to equilibrate and bring the system um, into a steady state. And so you have band bending and your electrons move from the rubrine to the perovskite and um, you get hole transfer from the perovskite to the rubrine. Um, so this is all in the dark. So this creates a space charge region. And uh, what we call this here is essentially pre-charging of our organic because um, you're already populating the, tr uh, the, the rubrine with, with holes. If you now send in a photon, you excite the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, and these can then undergo energy transfer or electron transfer to the triplet state, thus creating the triplet that we're looking for. Um, so we've spent a lot of the last two years uh, looking into these upconversion devices. So we focused on device fabrication. We're currently looking at the organic layer. Um, and we're also interested in the sensitizer and composition, uh, as well as the processing um, of the sensitizers. So the device fabrication, everything that we've uh, that I've shown here today, um, is a typical bilayer device structure. So the perovskite is fabricated and then the rubrine has just been coated on top. Uh, more recently, we've actually been able to show that you can mix the rubrine directly into the anti-solvent. Um, so this is a so-called one-step device uh, fabrication, which may lead towards um, more facile uh, applications in actual commercial devices. Uh, we've spent some time looking at the organic layer. So in particular, we've seen that there's different rates of upconversion, um, but mostly they're strong back transfer. So these are still problems that we're looking at. Next slide, please. 
Um, one of the big things that I've come across though in my two years now as a professor is that our academic education basically leads us to become a specialist in a very small field. Um, Germans would call us Fachidioten, which according to Pons is a specialist who has great knowledge of his or her own field and is not able to see beyond its limits. And so speaking with scientists outside of the field is not always straightforward and easily done. And more importantly, it's very, very difficult at times to convey scientific research to non-scientists. And so this leads me to science communication and outreach. So if we look at our uh, diagram here, there's the science and the research that we all do every day. There's applications that more often engineers are looking towards. And then there's just the art of fluorescent things. So uh, one thing that we've been working on with matter uh, is science communication. Uh, so just taking the idea of a quantum dot and uh, its size dependent band gap and showing how the color changes in cat selenide just based on the size. So as you increase the size, you get a shift from blue to red emission. Um, perovskites, as mentioned previously, uh, have a composition dependent uh, band gap. And therefore, if you change the halide, you can tune uh, the colors. Uh, and this brings us to the best day of the week. Um, can you start the video? Yeah. Um, Two videos, <laughs> maybe. So um, if you're not in the perovskite field, this is something that you generally don't get to see very often. Um, you can see essentially on the left, that video is just showing you the addition of lithium iodide to a cesium lead bromide solution. And just by dripping in the solution or the, the lithium iodide, you can see this rapid color change. And <laughs> in the top video, we just had some fun and tossed some dry ice into uh, our three different colors. But overall, this allows us to share are glowy things on Twitter. And we've actually been able to reach many, many people that don't generally get to see these uh, materials. So then the global pandemic began. So uh, instead of being in lab, we're all stuck at home. Can you forward? Um, that also means we don't get to play with lasers. Therefore, we don't really get to see our glowy things. Uh, and this just was not an option. Um, so this brings us to glow from home. Uh, you can actually take a black light, which you can get for about 10 bucks on Amazon, and uh, do some kitchen spectroscopy. And so what you can see here is a wide variety of fluorescent things I found in my own house. So eggs are fluorescent, you can find fluorescence in honey. Olive oil will actually change colors depending on how pure it is, how good it is, and which brand it is. Um, Turmeric root emits light, laundry detergent emits light. We all know highlighters look very bright, so they actually do also for us. And uh, tonic water uh, shows blue fluorescence. Um, so in the egg, you have the uh, protoporphyrin uh, in varying amounts and um, depending on the eggshell color. And so that shows reddish emission. Uh, honey has aromatic fluorophores, which show this characteristic green, yellow emission. Uh, chlorophyll and vitamin E in the olive oil um, are causing that to fluoresce. Uh, turmeric has curcumin in it. Uh, laundry detergent, you add optical brighteners to it. Uh, so this is actually intentional, just so your whites look whiter. Um, highlighter ink is uh, pretty obvious. And in tonic water, you can find quinine, which shows as blue fluorescence. 
And so you can actually find uh, glowy things pretty much anywhere. So uh, whether it's the gin and tonic that you're having on a Friday night, uh, I thought it was pretty interesting that pepperoncini peppers show bright red fluorescence. Uh, my running shoes are fluorescent as are most gym clothes I've realized, anything that you know, is a neon color. And uh, you can actually hide these uh, kitchen spectroscopy items amongst uh, things in the lab and it's really, really hard to differentiate. And so with that, I would like to thank my group so Sarah, Alex, and Zach, um, my collaborators uh, at KIT and at Georgia Tech. And uh, thank you all for listening. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much. And thanks for putting up with these technical difficulties. Um, so I think we have time for um, a couple of questions that have been submitted by the audience. Um, so the first question is, um, in terms of these nanoplate blitz um, for the for a conversion, mm -hmm. is the geometry or the confinement important? Um, and would you expect similar results on simple nanometer thin films? That way you don't have to worry about the stacking. So nanoplatelets are just confined in one direction. Um, nanometer thin films, I would, to first approximation, expect a similar behavior. Um, however, I believe that you probably would introduce so many trap states that the whole process wouldn't occur, but, um, yeah, okay. makes sense. Um, and that sort of leads into this second question here is like, how important is the quantum dots synthesis to understanding and controlling these properties in terms of both precision and the different geometries that you can make? It is very important. Um, yeah, but anybody who's ever made quantum dots knows that pretty much every time you try it, you get something slightly different. Mm -hmm. And so we're still working on perfecting the synthesis, whether it's for the platelets or for the quantum dots, just to make sure that they're reproducible because every synthesis, you have a different amount of trap states. You may have had the magic amount of humidity or oxygen or I don't know, the, the right contamination in your, your flask. Um, so. Yeah, and I can imagine in Florida that comes up quite a bit. In terms of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right then, um, I think we're gonna wrap up so that we can move on to the next talk. Um, and so the next speaker is Rafaela Monsanti, who started as a tenure track assistant professor at EPFL in uh, 2015. Um, and she implements a highly interdisciplinary approach that spans chemistry, material science, and chemical engineering to address fundamental challenges in energy technology. Um, as an expert in colloidal nanoparticle synthesis, she's looked up into she's looked up to in the nanoscience community as a leader not only because of her science, but also because of her advocacy for students and commitment to science communication. And we're very excited to have her today. Um, Rafaela, we can see your slides, which is great, and you can take it away. <laughs> all right, so first of all, thank you to uh, Michelle and Stacy for organizing this event, which gives me the opportunity to share with you some of the work that uh, we have been doing in my group related to life matter interaction. So as Stacy mentioned, most of our work is related to colloidal nanocrystals, which are constituted by an inorganic core and a shell of uh, uh, ligands. And these shell of ligands make them soluble in a large variety of solvent, solvents. So basically now we have a nanocrystal hink, which we can deposit on different substrates and integrate in different devices. <clears throat> Here I'm showing some electron microscopy images of uh, gold nanoparticles. So we can make them in different sizes and shapes. And why is it important to, to control size and shape is actually because the properties of nanocrystals are defined by size and shape. So uh, regarding optical properties, uh, here already Leah showed uh, beautiful uh, fluorescent uh, vials. So these are uh, cadmium selenide quantum dots, where when we change the size, uh, because of quantum confinement effect, we change the band gap and therefore uh, the uh, emission properties. But we also have metals and uh, in uh, many metallic uh, uh, nanoparticles, we have uh, what are called, uh, um, uh, uh, what is called plasmon absorption. And that is the reason why um, gold nanoparticles are pink instead of gold. 
gold color. And also in these cases, we change the size and shape, we can change the color. How do we make these uh, particles? Is by using wet chemistry. And uh, uh, so we are, uh, uh, yeah, we have this three neck flask where we control the temperature, the atmosphere, we have a heating mantle, and we usually choose some metal precursors, uh, fattens, and then we control reaction parameters so to obtain this monodispersizing shape. And normally, the uh, surfactants or ligands play a key role in controlling uh, the sides. For example, highly sterically inred uh, ligands will normally give small particles or the most trivial explanation for shape control is that they bind with different uh, binding strengths to different facets. Now, the truth is that um, uh, um, the synthesis development proceeds mostly by trials and errors, and that's why we have the, uh, the reproducibility issues that were just mentioned. And the problem also is that uh, while some chemical intuition can work when uh, we develop single component nanocrystals, as we move to multi-component nanocrystals, this chemical intuition does not work well anymore. And these multi-component nanocrystals, what I mean with multi-component nanocrystals are something like core shell materials or dimers or maybe multi-metallic particles or maybe multi-component might also include the nanoparticle and the metal organic frameworks, so building blocks of different chemical nature. And it's important to make these materials because often these interfaces are important for properties such as uh, electron transfer or energy transfer or uh, optimizing uh, like catalytic properties. Now, this is uh, the basic science challenge that uh, uh, I wanted to tackle. And then there is uh, another challenge that, uh, so I believe basically as scientists, we should also contribute to our society. And uh, so what, what really drives uh, my science is also the interest of contributing to sustainability and specifically, as you will uh, say, to clean energy and uh, climate action. So when I started my group at EPFL, I decided I will tackle, uh, I will uh, basically base my research on materials chemistry on one side and catalysis on the other side. And so we started to, uh, to really try to understand how nanocrystal synthesis work, especially in the context of uh, multi-component nanocrystals. And also we started to use uh, these nanocrystals as uh, uh, catalysts or photocatalysts for the conversion of uh, small molecules. And in particular, we have been focusing on the conversion of CO2 into chemicals. Now, uh, a lot of, we have done uh, a lot of work on the electrocatalysis part, so the dark side, but uh, today I will share with you something that is a bit uh, um, uh, newer in the group, but is also of our interest, that is uh, using uh, um, the sun to directly drive uh, um, um, chemical transformations. And so, basically, our idea was... Uh, okay, can we use uh, quantum dots uh, as uh, uh, antenna pigments uh, to drive uh, uh, chemical transformation? And this takes inspiration from natural photosynthesis, where indeed we have uh, migration of electronic energy from this antenna pigment uh, to the reaction center. And so we were looking, okay, can we do the same with quantum dots? And to do this, we will need quantum dots, we will need a spacer because we want to base um, the process of an energy transfer rather than charge transfer. And then uh, we're gonna need to, to funnel this energy towards a catalyst and these catalysts are usually metal nanoparticles. And then, okay, we want to drive a reaction. So which quantum dot to start with? These were already mentioned by Leah, so it was a perfect uh, introduction. And basically, yeah, right as uh, I started my laboratory, so in 2000, end of 2015, um, these perovskite nanocrystals were introduced. They are special because uh, we can change their optical properties, not only with the sides, but also with the composition, so by just changing the Li. They have a very high quantum yield compared to uh, many other uh, uh, quantum dots reported in the literature. They have large carrier diffusion length. They're also quite straightforward to synthesize, but they are highly unstable and reactive. So if we really wanted to use them as the, uh, uh, antenna pigments, we had to solve first this issue to at least measure them. 
Now, there, are, there have been beautiful work in the literature uh, on energy transfer with uh, quantum dots. In many of these examples, the spacer was actually, were actually uh, organic ligands or organic moieties of some sort. And uh, um, these, uh, uh, there are two issues with these organic ligands. One is that the spacing, I mean, the distance between the quantum dot is uh, um, is uh, uh, the tuning of the distance is kind of limited because uh, we cannot go to really um, uh, high distances, big distances, because uh, the the um, the carbon chains are quite uh, uh, quite um, uh, mobile and it's difficult to keep the distance constant between the quantum dot and especially in the case of the perovskite these organic ligands will not have prevented will not have protected. Uh, the, the perovskite from uh, from degradation. So we decided that our spacer was going to be uh, were going to be metal oxides, and uh, the best way to deposit the thin films of metal oxide and to control the thickness so that we could control the spacing between the quantum dots is atomic layer deposition. So traditionally, atomic layer deposition is conducted in uh, gas phase. And uh, uh, the first uh, uh, material we wanted to deposit uh, is uh, uh, alumina. And uh, what, uh, uh, what you do to deposit alumina in an ALD chamber is uh, you pulse the trimethyl aluminum. Then the trimethyl aluminum reacts with the surface of your material. Then you purge, so you eliminate the excess uh, reagent. Then you expose to water and then you purge. And water starts to react with the trimethyl aluminum on the surface. You form the first layer of metal oxide, and then you can repeat the cycle in order to tune the thickness of this metal oxide. So we adjusted the process to uh, fit with the perovskite uh, nanocrystals, and this is work of my postdoc Anna. And uh, you can notice basically on the left a film of perovskite nanocrystals non protected, and uh, that is dissolving in water. And uh, on the right, a film of perovskite nanocrystals that has the alumina layer on top. And so you can at least, uh, I mean, it can stay in water for some time. We um, performed a lot of uh, microscopy techniques to make sure that the size and shape of our perovskite nanocrystals were preserved. And also some uh, mapping uh, informed us on, on the fact that the aluminum was present throughout the film thickness and was also capping. The, the film. Uh, thanks to this uh, coating, uh, we were able to make uh, these perovskite nanocrystals stable uh, in uh, under light. So basically, the PL intensity does not change, and also the PL peak position does not change. They are also stable to sintering because there is aluminum oxide in between the quantum dots, so they don't sinter when we anneal them, and they remain relatively more stable in water. So this is not a solved issue. It's but at least uh, yeah, they, they, they can last up to one hour, so we can measure, we can start at least evaluating if they are good candidates as uh, light uh, uh, harvesting, uh, to, to build a light harvesting antenna. So now that we, we made these nanocrystals a bit more stable in uh, uh, water environment, we wanted to see if actually we could transfer energy to a metal, nano, a metal catalyst and then drive a chemical reaction. Now, I must say that we also discover that this spacer is absolutely needed because these perovskite nanocrystals, if you mix them with the metal nanoparticles, they will react with them. So basically, the iodine will be driven out of the lattice and this will cause chemical, uh, chemical, uh, chemical changes and, of course, changes of the optical properties. So having this spacer of alumina is extremely needed. So my PhD in stereo uh, built uh, this uh, light harvesting antenna, which included uh, a layer of perovskite nanocrystal, the alumina spacer, and uh, the silver uh, nanoparticles on top. The uh, optical properties of uh, uh, the uh, perovskite nanocrystals and uh, the silver nanoparticles uh, match well the requirement for energy transfer. The two layers are well separated, so they, they cannot react with each other. And we were able to tune the, uh, with the ALD the thickness of this uh, uh, alumina layer uh, so from, uh, from uh, um, 2 nanometer up to 20 nanometer 
in order to study the uh, distance dependent uh, properties. And what we found is that uh, as the distance uh, uh, decreases, both uh, we have uh, um, an uh, increase of the PL lifetime quenching efficiency and also an increase of the PL quantum yield quenching efficiency. The two of them together indicate that uh, there is uh, that the dominating mechanism is energy transfer from the perovskite nanocrystals to the silver through a non-radiative process. Now, having assessed that uh, there can be some energy transfer between uh, the, the, um, the light absorber and the catalyst, we wanted to see if we could drive a reaction. And in this case, we chose a very simple reaction, which is the desorption of the methylene blue. And we monitor the desorption using a Raman, the Raman signal of this uh, dye. And we could see that uh, um, the, the antenna uh, behaves much better compared to the single component. And moreover, that there is a, a distance dependence that was kind of expected in the sense that uh, smaller distances uh, mean also faster uh, degradation, faster desorption of the dye. Uh, and, uh, okay, this better behavior of the antenna is related to the extended spectral absorption in this hybrid photosystem. Now, okay, having assessed that we can do this transfer and we can drive a reaction, we wanted now to explore energy transfer between uh, quantum dots in the presence of the spacer. However, we also wanted to switch back to our beloved solution because we do love to to uh, work with hints and with solution where, which gives us more flexibility in terms of the techniques that we can use in terms of the substrate that we can use for devices. So, and so we wanted to grow at this point an oxide shell, but in solution. Now, when we think about oxide coatings in nanoparticles, the most common uh, coating is silica. So you can buy from Sigma Aldrich, you can buy these uh, silica coated gold nanoparticles. The problem with this uh, silica, uh, silica uh, coating is that it's synthesized with this uh, Stober method, which is based on hydrolysis and condensation of the uh, of alkyl oxide precursor. And here, basically, we have uh, that um, uh, water is required, and this is not compatible with the sensitive cores, such as the perovskite nanocrystals. Also, we have a shell thickness, which is about five nanometer, and so we cannot really reach. Uh, we don't have like a very tunable platform to understand when an electron transfer and when energy transfer is occurring. And also, it's difficult to tune the shell because uh, it's hydrolysis and condensation. It's not this layer by layer approach. So what uh, my postdoc Anna did was uh, to develop a colloidal ALD approach, which is really very similar to the gas phase ALD, but occurs in solution. So we have our nanocrystals in solution, and we add sequentially the trimethyl aluminum and the, the oxygen in solution. So we reproduce basically the same cycle that I showed you a few slides back. We also looked into the nucleation and how nucleation occurs, but I'm skipping this part uh, for, uh, for this talk. What is important is that we were able to grow this oxide shell of many different materials, including metal oxide, metals, and the perovskite. And we could use a technique such as dynamic light, simple dynamic light scattering to observe the growth of the shell, which we could tune really at uh, uh, the um, below nano, yeah, of 0.36 nanometer per cycle, because 0.36 corresponds to the aluminum oxygen bond. So this is a layer by layer technique. So that's why it's very really precise tuning of this shell. Again, we, do, we did gain some stability of, uh, of this perovskite in contact with water. And then we decided, uh, so great introduction again, because these nanoplatelets were already mentioned. And there were in the literature some interesting examples of how dimensionality impact uh, uh, energy, uh, electron and energy transfer rates. And so we decided to explore energy transfer, to use the shell basically, to be the platform to study uh, the transfer of electronic energy from uh, um, uh, perovskite quantum dot to cadmium selenide nanoplatelets. Um, and what we found, uh, we use different spectroscopy techniques, and uh, what we observe is that uh, there is a faster PL decay for the donor, 
a slower PL decay for the acceptor. And from this data, we uh, extracted the average lifetime and we could basically um, plot the, um, the, um, uh, the energy transfer rate, the, the energy transfer rate versus the distance between the quantum dot. And what we realized what that was that, uh, uh, I mean, what we realized, what we, we found is that actually this, uh, the, the, having this shell of oxide uh, builds up a, fl a platform to control the, the way in which energy is, uh, electronic energy is uh, uh, transmitted from one quantum dot to the other, in the sense that when we are below 2.5 nanometer, electron transfer dominates. As we start to go above 2.5 nanometer uh, shell thickness, then we can have energy transfer as dominating mechanism. We also uh, proved that in conditions that are usually utilized for uh, uh, photoelectrochemical CO2 reduction, these quantum dots in the presence of the shell are much more stable compared to unprotected quantum dots. And also interestingly, the photocurrent that we measure when we have the mixed quantum dots, I mean the, the cesium lead bromide and the cadmium selenide, is uh, uh, more intense is, is much more than the sum of the isolated component, indicating also here that there are some synergism between the two of them. So basically, okay, now we could really, uh, we start to, to confirm the idea that maybe it's possible to use these perovskite nanocrystals as uh, antenna pigment. We can transfer energy between the quantum dots. We can funnel energy towards uh, uh, a catalyst, uh, a metallic nanoparticles, and we can drive some redox chemistry. However, so far, what we have done is just this desorption of the dye. And uh, so our next step is actually try to really reduce CO2. And so the idea is now to combine this, uh, um, this work more related to light material interaction to our work on electrocatalysis, where basically here we, um, uh, copper is one of the main uh, catalysts for, uh, uh, for converting CO2. And what we are doing is quite uh, uh, substantial work on controlling the, the, the copper size and shape, because what we find is that the copper size and shape determines which product we obtain for the conversion of CO2. So for example, we obtain ethylene from CO2 if uh, uh, we use nanocubes and we obtain methane if we use uh, um, uh, nanoctahedra and a mixed uh, product distribution if, you, if we use spheres. So now we are curious to see if we can drive this uh, conversion directly with light, or maybe if light also is going to impact the reaction mechanism and therefore the selectivity that, uh, that we uh, find uh, with these uh, uh, copper-based uh, uh, nanocrystals. And with this, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, um, really like to acknowledge the people that contributed to the work that I share with you today, which are my postdoc Anna, my student uh, Stavio, and uh, Valerie, who was with the, was a Fulbright uh, um, uh, fellow with us for one year, and now she's a PhD student in Stanford. And I would like to thank uh, uh, for this work, uh, the National Science Foundation, and uh, thank you for your attention. Hi, thanks so much for that amazing talk, Raffaella. As a reminder to everyone that's listening, this webinar will be recorded and can be accessible later. So you can see all the beautiful images and nanoparticles whenever you want. So we have time for a few questions submitted by the audience. Um, thank you all for your participation. There's so many questions. Um, we'll try to collect all questions, including those not asked, um, and get them up on Twitter with some answers um, after the talk. So if your question's not asked, don't worry about it. Um, so first for Rafaela, um, one of the questions that we have here is that there's been a lot of talk about making perovskites more environmentally friendly. Um, do you see any promise for using non-lead perovskites um, for, for these types of applications? Um, mm. Do you see any exciting stuff going on? Yeah, I think there has been an uh, introduction of a, a team-based perovskite instead of lead. So I think uh, this could be promising, but again, there is also this stability issue that uh, uh, should be uh, taken into account. So um, 
yeah, I guess this team-based perovskite could be an option. Honestly, we also don't have to necessarily focus on perovskite. Some interesting uh, materials are also these uh, carbon dots. So we could also switch to carbon-based materials if really we are looking for environmental-friendly uh, dots. Cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, also, along these lines, um, so you mentioned stability, which is one of these major challenges yeah. for these things to be um, at a commercial scale. Um, what other challenges do you think they are besides stability? Well, I mean, it was already mentioned the presence of, uh, of lead. So, okay. I mean, uh, is, uh, is uh, stability is a challenge, but I think there are now many different uh, um, protection schemes which uh, are, uh, are working and also, again, is investigating the mechanism. So um, scientists have been dedicating a lot of effort to investigate the mechanism that are involved in the degradation of the perovskite. And once we learn more about the mechanism, we can also develop smarter ways to make them more stable. And also, there are also some mixed uh, um, organic, uh, like if we play with the counter ion, we can also achieve uh, better stability. So there is quite a bit of uh, um, yeah, research going on. So Yeah, interesting. Um, and this last question is a little bit um, more technical about the process. So they're talking about the oxide layer and ah, yeah. um, the perovskite. What does that layer kind of look like? Is there a ligand layer between or, or what? Ah, great question. Yes, so the ligands are still there. I, I think uh, it's because I skipped the, actually the ligands are quite important. Because, so they are still present and what we notice is that uh, the ligands can also act as anchoring, as nucleation site for uh, the alumina layer. So basically we do need an oxygen site and this oxygen site can be on the surface of the nanocrystals if they are slightly oxidized, but also the ligand themselves can act as, uh, uh, as uh, nucleation site. And I have actually now a student uh, that she's continuing some uh, NMAR studies to really understand better the role of the ligands in this colloidal uh, ELD. Awesome. Yeah. So summary ligands are important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rafaela. Um, so now for our last speaker, it's Bozi Tian. So Bozi Tian is currently an associate professor at the University of Chicago and focuses on different aspects of light matter interactions than what we've just heard about. Instead of energy applications, Bozi and his group use semiconductors to look at bio interfaces and understand biological dynamics. Bozy gets his inspiration from many places, including a recent paper in Matter that was inspired by noodles. Bozy, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stacey, uh, for your nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to this webinar. I'm a material scientist uh, from the University of Chicago, and my lab research has been focused on uh, semiconductor-based biointerfaces. And recently, we also started to uh, study uh, some soft materials. So today, my talk contains two parts. In the first part, I'm going to show you how we use light and semiconductor to modulate the biological activities. And in my second part, I will show you some of the activities from my lab during this lockdown period. Uh, many of us today are material scientists, and we synthesize and also study synthetic materials. And many of those synthetic materials are excellent, uh, excellent tools for study biological dynamics. Let's just take our uh, central nervous system as one example. And there are very diverse materials such as magnetic nanoparticles and upper conversion nanoparticles, and they have been um, used to allow the remote control of the deep brain activities. And other electronic materials, such as silicon-based nanomembrane and then graphene, they have been used for electrical recording of the brain activities or the transcranial uh, brain pressure. So our lab has developed a set of silicon-based freestanding materials for modulation studies. And silicon is only one type of the semiconductor. And in fact, there are many semiconductors that can establish functional and also compatible biointerfaces. A unique thing about semiconductors is that it has a well-defined semiconductor, uh, the band gap, and many of those materials can absorb light and uh, can emit light as well. And they have characteristic band edge positions which allow us to predict the ideal um, electrochemical or uh, photoelectric chemical behaviors under the physiological condition. And many of those materials are 
accept from electronic systems as well. So you can configure electronic devices as simple as a feed fat transistor. And because of those unique properties and very diverse applications, semiconductor materials and devices have been used to establish um, um, very different types of bio interface. For example, they can be used as an image, uh, imaging agent uh, to track the intracellular uh, dynamics of the organelles. They can be used to record from inside of cells the electrophysiology activities or used to modulate the cell or tissue activities. And they can even serve as a passive scaffold to guide the cell or tissue growth. So today, I will mostly focus on using semiconductor as optoelectronic materials to modulate the cell or tissue behaviors. And I will um, show you a few examples just to briefly uh, illustrate the capability in our lab. So in this first case, uh, I'm going to focus on the single neural modulation using coaxosilicon wire. And this work was done by my former MD PhD student, Ramya, and she's currently completing her uh, MD degree at the University of Chicago. And the material that we used for this study is this coaxial silicon nanowire containing a p-type core, intrinsic shell, and then this outermost shell. And we characterize our materials, and what we found is that over the surface and the green boundaries, there are a lot of atomic gold. And this atomic gold dispersion, this gold actually came from these starting gold nanoparticles that we use to catalyze the growth uh, for the silicon wire. And we also found out that this atomic gold actually can promote the uh, light generated charge injection into solution causing the chemical reaction. So now imagine there we, uh, we have built up this bow interface. We have a coaxial silicon wire, and we also have a piece of a cell membrane from neuron. Now, upon light excitation, you have, of course, both the anodic and the solid direction, but because the castle part is closer to the cell membrane. So the cell mostly feels the impact from the castle, uh, which tends to reduce the polarity of the cell membrane. And not in the example cells that can elicit the action potentials. So that's exactly what Ramya did. And she delivered those light pulses with different uh, frequencies, say uh, 10 hertz or 20 hertz. And we can actually modulate pace the neuron firing frequencies at the target frequencies. While the coaxial silicon nanowire can only target a single cell, if we uh, um, hope to target tissues or organs, we probably need to use a different material. And one option is this a multi-layer silicon uh, membranes can also contain p-type and intrinsic and n-type different domains. And this work uh, was done by my former graduate student, uh, Ryan Wenjian, and he is currently a postdoc at Stanford. So in this work, uh, he synthesized this multi-layer silicon membrane using a chemical vapor deposition process, and then used this lithography method to make a material we call uh, uh, silicon, uh, uh, this mesh structure. And in parallel, we have also prepared this porous PDMS membrane. So PDMS is elastomer. So then we can place those two materials together, and this hybrid system is flexible and can conform to the surface of the cortex. And then he can shine light to different parts of the cortex, let's say the motor cortex part. Then what we observe is this induced flowing motion uh, due to this uh, contralateral control. In the previous two examples, I show you that we can use silicon coax and nanowire and also uh, silicon multilayer membrane for biological modulation. But if you think about these modulators, uh, they are non living so the next question that we had is, can we attribute a living modulator so that the signal transduction can be more biological? And for this specific work, uh, um, it was done by my postdoc, Henry Gutenberg, and he currently uh, is my postdoc, but he actually will start his independent research lab as the assistant professor in the bioengineering department at Technion, uh, very soon. So in this project, he create those hybrid myofiber blocks and certain nanowire composite through this phagocytosis process. And then he delivered those hybrid uh, cyber composite into either a culture cutting mouse site or direct into the heart. And then uh, Hammy delivered the light pulse right, uh, with certain frequency. And that can trigger the elevation of the intracellular calcium uh, signals due to a combination of a uh, photoelectrochemical and a photothermal effect. Then this induced signal, calcium signal, can be transmitted to other adjacent cells and eventually reach the cardiomyocyte. 
So now you can imagine that if we give the light pulse a certain frequency, you potentially can train or even paste the cutting mouse. So let me just show you the video. So initially, what you see here, so you probably see those flashes. Those are the uh, calcium signals from the individual cutting mouse site. So initially, before the pacing of training, those flashes are not synchronous. But after we do a certain period of this pacing uh, training, you see now that all those other kind of mouse that become, at least within this field of view, become synchronous beating. And if the bottom part shows the state of trace, right? So before we give the light pulse, those calcium signal, the spikes, are kind of a low frequency and also not periodic. But after we start this training process, the frequency get increased and eventually reach our targeted frequency. And after we stop light pulse, you can actually see that the cells almost memorize this training process. You can call this the memory effect and keep that beating frequency for a certain period of time. So using this very uh, similar processes, we have uh, created um, very different intracellular and intercellular and extracellular interfaces in nervous system, cardiovascular system, and even in the microbial system. So I, I indeed want to uh, highlight one work that recently from our lab, right? We use silicon-based constructs, and we actually discover a calcium wave obligation in the biofilm. So if you're interested in this work, in this table, this in this table, you can actually go to some of our recent publications uh, from individual lab members. I also want to take this opportunity to actually highlight some of the uh, uh, other reading, uh, other paper, uh, publications from uh, different research labs. And in fact, they have done uh, really done exceptional work and they used uh, um, more sophisticated animal models um, I, uh, that the or biological system than we did in our work. And you can see some of the papers are relevant to retinal system or microbial system and um, or a combination of the semiconductor based uh, optoelectronic or photonic processes with optogenetics. So I highly recommend those papers and you can read the papers uh, from uh, this, uh, their good website or just search in the uh, web science. And um, yeah, you will benefit a lot from those readings. All right, so uh, how is our approach different from the prior methods? So far, there are two major methods. One is called electro-based method, and this has been practiced for centuries. The good thing is that it is non-genetic, and that explains why this can be applied for uh, in the clinical setting used in patient. But it is, in terms of the uh, operation, it is rather rigid meaning that the location where you do the stimulation or do the sensing really depends on where you place your electrode. Optogenetics has been very powerful since 2005, and it is, has generated a huge amount of the progress in understanding the uh, mechanisms of uh, underlying the neurological diseases. But it uses genetic modification. That means that if you want to apply this to a larger brain mammals at this stage, uh, there still would be some technical and also ethical hurdle. But the good thing is it uses light, right? So uh, it's very flexible. You can shine light anywhere you want and then uh, stimulate some activities. Our process that uses semiconducting light somehow can combine the advantages of those two methods. Um, namely, the being non-genetic, right? And recently, we also found out that the uh, light intensity that you be, uh, that we can use to trigger uh, this balance modulation can be reduced down to that uh, the similar level for optogenetics. For example, we can use uh, that uh, low intensity light to actually place the entire heart. And given time, I won't uh, be able to talk about this latest work. So, so far, I have told you uh, to use light and semiconductor to uh, modulate the biological activities. It's all about training, all about training of the single cells or tissues. The next question we ask ourselves is, can we use the information from the spa interface studies to actually help us design and implement some trainable and synthetic materials? And the answer to this question can have a lot of implications in the design of the uh, future soft robotics or adaptable uh, implantable devices. So recently, um, my post at Yinfan um, has discovered the incorporation of some hydrated starch granules into some traditional hydrogels can turn those traditional hydrogels into a tissue-like material. If you look at the, our tissue, right, tissue organ, this mechanic properties um, are very, very unique. There are some dynamic responses, there's impact absorption, there's anisotropy, there's even a training and memory effect. But it's extremely challenging to have all those properties uh, 
build up in the single material, synthetic material. And what we achieve found is that actually we can do this. And just the only trick is just incorporation of this uh, granular systems. And now you have this very diverse tissue-like properties. And more importantly, we actually can use those external mechanical me manipulation to encode some mesoscopic states inside our material. And you can encode that you can read it. Um, and those mesoscopic states can be uh, uh, characterized using the synchrotron-based X-ray imaging technique. So, so far, I have talked about how we use semiconductors and light to modulate the bioelectrical activities of single cells and tissues, and also talk about, uh, about creating trainable material through those granules-based uh, composite interfaces. Um, those examples are actually all about adaptation. That is how materials and or about a lot of components adapt to the external variations. Now we're in a very special period of time, and many of us may feel the stress, unexpected situation, and delays. Uh, we need to know what we can and what we cannot do. Uh, for most researchers, we cannot do experiments now. And um, but we can go back to our previous results and dig deeper into the data analysis. We can show our compassion and generosity for others, especially those whose situation would be poor. As PIs, this is a actually a great period of time to learn and practice leadership. The leadership is not just to be the top person in a specific field of science or engineering. It's actually more about helping and supporting others to achieve their own success and placing others into the spotlight. Uh, this pandemic is also a good time to reflect on medicine and academia. When we look back uh, to the past, including both the hardships and the highlights, uh, we could actually have a deeper sense of the gratitude and have a better hope for the future. This is just like when we prepare a review paper on certain uh, research subjects, such as the nanowire-based biointerfaces, right? So we can see both the progress and setbacks in this field, and then we could have a more positive and clear idea of what we could do next. Now, most of us are working from home, and we actually can have a better control of our emotions because we can choose what we see, what we hear, and what we do. This is a, a bodily emotion map um, that was published many years ago. The red and the yellow colors represent enhanced body emotions, while the blue and cyan colors mean uh, the reduced uh, sensations. It is quite striking that this positive and this negative emotions can cause such a big impact over the different parts of the body. So how did we do in our lab to enhance this positive emotions such as um, the pride, um, the happiness, and the love? So I have, uh, uh, for example, I have uh, um, um, uh, told my lab members that besides focusing on the data analysis for your research, you actually can do anything that can make your future career better. For example, taking a new course, uh, such as a machine learning course, or learn some new programming tools. I also constantly send some funny videos and some pictures to the lab uh, so that they can laugh really hard. I have told my lab members to have more compassion and generosity for others and have encouraged uh, multiple types of donations, such as donation to children in some countries. And of course, uh, doing a lot more exercises to combat those negative emotions is also extremely important. To help our lab members communicate with each other better, we started to use this Microsoft Teams since the mid-March, uh, where we sent notes and also share documents. In particular, we have weekly updates. And here's just to show uh, one of this question, how do you feel last week? And this is the statistics from all these weekly uh, updates from our lab members sent over the past two months, where the light orange color means um, as expected, and this dark blue color means uh, not applicable, so you can just uh, ignore those dark blue regions. So each week, we checked our lab members' well-being, the paperwork, and also the status of the collaboration. And here's what we found. The quality of the paperwork, such as the writing, uh, the manuscript writing or the data analysis, is actually comparable to 
our expectation or the outcome during the normal time. But the efficiency of the remote collaboration and also this general learning experience are actually better than expected. And also the mental, uh, mental health is overall better too. So here actually shows uh, uh, one of the notes that uh, my student uh, sent me about one week ago. And as you can see that indeed, there are a lot of positive surprises uh, during this lockdown. The lockdown gives us more time to think. And I once set up this questionnaire about the message to generate creative ideas. The result is shown here. And as expected, most of us acquire new ideas from other papers or other people, but we don't have many effective methods to actually enhance um, this process. We always talk about brainstorming, and it works for producing good ideas because there are things unexpected and spontaneous, and there are also things that are unstructured but are logically connected. Now, the question is, during this lockdown, how can we still produce some similar effect of brainstorming even when we work alone? And can this master be scientific? So here's what I shared with my lab members at the beginning of this lockdown. We use Viable Science as the platform for virtual brainstorming. We are all familiar with the literature search. We find one a particular paper, let's call it paper B. Then sometimes we will uh, check its references as marked by the variables pointing to this paper B. And sometimes we would also check the papers that cite the starting one as marked by the arrows that pointing away from this paper B, such as the cited uh, paper C. If you're not one of those authors for this particular starting paper B, it is very possible that you can actually see some unfamiliar papers, flip it forward and backward checking. And this is where we can get those unexpected and spontaneous elements, uh, just like what we experienced during this brainstorming. If we stay, uh, stay around this group, we can already get a lot of useful information, but we can actually do more. We can move into this paper C and check its references and the papers that cite this reference C. Now, you could find a path from A and all the way to D following the direction of this arrow. However, this is a structured situation. What we hope to have is actually the unstructured but logically connected one. How can we achieve that? We can instead start with a paper that uh, cite this paper B and end with a paper that is one of the references uh, for this paper C. Now you cannot follow an arrow direction to go from A to D. Or you can call this actually the unstructured but still logically connected situation. Now we have almost all these elements for brainstorming and we're in the position to ask this question. Is there a direct path from A to D, and oftentimes the answer is yes. And that's where you could get a new idea. To generate good ideas, um, the most critical part is really not the part of solving the problem itself, but to ask an unconventional question. And what I present here now may be just one way of getting this type of question. Besides using the web of science or other research tools to generate ideas, uh, we can use our own results. If we think about the typical flow of a scientific process, we start with these initial observations, um, which are always usually surprising and unexpected. Then we see our hypothesis and we use a set of experiments to confirm and revert, uh, revise the hypothesis. And our ultimate goal is to have a set of lower theory that can be broadly applied to our situations. During this lockdown, there are only two elements that are left, the initial observation and the initial hypothesis. While we are always told that when we are uh, doing our initial search process, uh, we should always keep uh, being open-minded, right? But uh, um, in fact, uh, our thoughts may still be biased or focus only a certain set of directions, and thus that would uh, leave certain observations less useful. But now what we can do is to change the lens of our mindset and actually look at our uh, 
uh, original observations, the previous observations um, that we thought are uh, not that useful. And if we pay attention to details, we actually may pick up something that is very interesting. And then start from there, we can establish some new hypotheses. And all of us actually have our own gold mines, and we just need to uh, explore the different parts of that gold mine at different time point. So I think with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, all my current and past lab members, and also my uh, collaborators. Uh, and um, I would say that uh, uh, they're really the heroes, and uh, it, uh, every day uh, I'm actually illuminated by them, and it has been a great pleasure uh, to work in, uh, with this team. And finally, I would like to thank the Matter and the iScience for organizing uh, this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bozi, for the engaging talk. And also, thank you for your commitment for your students and your lab in this really tough time. It's really wonderful to see that. Um, we have a few questions submitted by the audience, so let's check them out. So is there a specific wavelength of light you need to stimulate the cells? Are there other wavelengths that would be desirable and what would make them desirable? Yes, um, good question. So uh, uh, currently we mostly focus on silicon-based materials and the um, given the band gap of silicon, in principle, can use light with wavelengths all the way to 1100 nanometers. Um, so that means that we can use in near infrared light as well as the uh, visible light. Um, and in our experiment, mostly we use visible light, uh, like with a wavelength of uh, uh, 532 nanometers. But we can certainly go to near infrared light as well. Yeah. So it really depends on what thermoconductors that we're uh, we're using. Interesting. Yeah. So um, another question is kind of uh, is kind of interesting. So bringing the semiconductor work together with your work on trainable materials, do you think there is a way to use light to do the external manipulation needed for the trainable materials? Uh, well, uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, one possible. So one thing actually, my lab is currently working on, and it's kind of a new direction, is to. Uh, understand the interface between semiconductor and uh, hydrogel. Um, so people have studied the interface between semiconductor and liquid, um, but also the uh, hydrogels and with, for example, granular materials or other like uh, inorganic materials. But the interface between semiconductor and hydrogel has not really been studied. There's very limited fundamental uh, investigation in that area. So we're doing that. And one poten uh, a possibility is uh, to use semiconductor, right? So you can just do shown light and then um, from the surface of the semiconductor you can generate those photothermal or photoelectrochemical effect then depending on the materials the, the soft materials you're using the material can be responsible to elect, uh, electrochemical effect or the thermal effect then you can trigger some response so that's how we could potentially do that's really interesting yeah we're looking forward to hearing more of your future work <laughs> thank you Okay, um, so now I think without further ado, it's time to um, switch to the panel. So Stacy and I would like to start our panel discussion so you can actually see our wonderful presenters. We know that all these canceled conferences aren't just about missing out on science, but also missing out on meeting with the community. We'd like to hear a bit more about how Leah, Rafaela, and Bozzi have been adapting and engaging during the current situation. Please submit your questions so that we can hear your thoughts and your questions as well, because we want you to be part of this discussion too. We also know that PIs aren't the only ones affected. So an hour after this is over, we are moving on over to Twitter and we're gonna hear from others. So PI, um, postdocs, students, um, future faculty, and just scientists. So um, you can follow along on the Matter Twitter, so at Matter underscore CP, or you can find it with the hashtag, hashtag shine a light. So here we can see our presenters. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Um, so the first question, um, thank you all for your lovely presentations. It was really wonderful. And now it's even more wonderful to see your faces. How has um, COVID-19 changed the way that you're interacting with the scientific community? Yeah, we'll start. <laughs> well, I guess I, I can start. So I guess it was much more, uh, yeah, Twitter became uh, more, uh, I became a bit more active. 
And then honestly, all these uh, online conferences uh, also I have participated to, uh, yeah, this is my second one. And I find that also is interesting. I mean, it's a new way to, to learn uh, about what other people are doing. It's still different because uh, well, our attention span is much shorter on uh, just looking at a boring, uh, uh, I mean, even if the presentation is super interesting, but still it's more difficult to just look at uh, a screen. So we have also to get used to that. But I think it's also, it was also amazing how many more people than can attend the event compared to traveling uh, in, uh, in uh, different places. So I think there are pros and cons of uh, the situation. Um, yeah, so, so for me, I actually feel that uh, I have more uh, uh, communication and, uh, with uh, people in my community. And uh, we, because now we have a lot of time, right? So I, I usually just have Zoom meetings and uh, call them or just write in emails. And so I think that in terms of communication, uh, it actually got enhanced. And as I mentioned in my talk, we use the Microsoft Teams and it works really well. We, we only started like two months ago and it turned out to be a great managing tool. And I can check um, my lab members' well-being and other things, activities. Um, so I think in terms of uh, the only things that we can not do experiment, but we have to adapt to this uh, new changes. Um, but other than that, I didn't see, uh, I only see good things that, uh, other than cannot do experiments, yeah. Yeah, another question we got on the on the chat now, which is follow up to all of this is, do you think that large in person conferences should have some online component in the future? Or how would that look like? Because there wouldn't be coffee breaks, you wouldn't be able to meet people. Mm -hmm. But how could this look like? Do you think? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Am I still muted? Nope, no. you're good. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that you can you can add some online component, but conferences aren't just talks. It's you know the coffee breaks. Mm -hmm. It's going to dinner. It's meeting people. It's talking, and it's basically bonding over more than just science. And then understanding how, you know, somebody who's in a completely different field could be beneficial um, in, in, you know, developing new ideas or research directions. And I, I, I'm very much enjoying all of these online conferences and meetups uh, lately because, it, of course, it's, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't get the same overall experience out of it. And so I don't think that we can possibly ever move completely to online. Yeah, I completely agree. I think part or maybe, yeah, not going to 10 conferences per year, but a few, but uh, I completely agree with uh, Al, with that is uh, it's more than just uh, listening to talks. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I feel that, yeah, so in-person meetings, um, it's very, very important. Um, um, but for those like virtual meetings, one thing I found particularly interesting and also quite good um, is that you can see the presenters like face, right? So uh, uh, you can uh, get their facial expression uh, better and mm -hmm. that actually bring closer right, mm -hmm. between the audience and the presenter. And this is a good thing, right? Because now you really know uh, that what the presenter might think and uh, like bringing up shortening shortening this distance actually it's a good thing um, and you probably cannot like for most people may not have that opportunity if you attend meetings like in person so oftentimes the presenter probably after the talk uh, he or she will just leave that class in so yeah yeah, so I think that that is uh, that is a lot of the questions that we have about conferences um, and things like that. But I think we should shift gears a little about how how 
this COVID-19 is, is changing your approach to research. So there's a bunch of questions that just popped up now. Um, how do you, uh, this might be coming from students or postdocs, but how do you deal with the anxiety about, you know, your projects still being there and not being able to complete them? Um, how do you cope with that inability to go into the labs if there's revisions on papers or things like that? Um, so I think that is something we should discuss because it's a big part of these few months. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to start. The easiest way to deal with anxiety in my case is my cats. They drive me nuts. But, uh, you know, uh, they've definitely, uh, you know, been some support. Um, so we're actually allowed back in lab a little bit. Um, so I'm limited to two people in the lab, but since I have two students, it actually works out perfectly. Um, I have not come across any reviewers requiring in lab um, revisions lately. I think a lot of people have been accepting of the fact that things are not normal right now. Um, and thankfully, I have some instruments that I can remote control. So um, I essentially sit at home and run the STM from here. Um, but I think one of the biggest issues that we're running into is maintaining the motivation to keep going because there is a big difference between sitting in lab with three people around you and, you know, everybody working together and everybody trying to get something done at home. Yeah, for me, what I told my group uh, is that imagine that this is a worldwide uh, situation. So it's not only you, it's really like the entire world, uh, from uh, Asia to US to Europe. So I don't think we need to stress about it because it's really the entire community that is living exactly the same situation. So we're all in the same boat and uh, we all, yeah, we're all dealing with this and we just have to be patient. I mean, it's... Uh, it's not, yeah, writing reviews also. We've been writing reviews. I think <laughs> we'll have an increment of reviews. But yeah, just be patient. And uh, yeah, we are all in the same boat. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll make it out somehow. Yes. Uh, so uh, for me, um, uh, I also, in our lab, we also have situations like we can all do revisions. And I think the editors are, uh, they really consider the situation and they're, they're very helpful and they give us extension. And um, and for, for me, for our lab members, uh, as I told, I mentioned in the, in the talk, so I constantly encourage them to actually learn new things. And I told them this is, now it is your opportunities. You have uh, all your control and you need to learn something that can benefit your future career. You can, uh, you can you learn your skills. It doesn't need to be related to research, right? As long as you find it useful for your future jobs, it can be industry, it can be in academia. But if you find it important, like machine learning, then you you can you should just start learning that and it is important so i think um if uh, our pis um uh, will encourage students and then students will not be stressed and then and, uh, they will just do what is important for them good for them yeah thank you Mo bozy for bringing up that point about um editors being human we, we try to be we try to be a uh, human especially during these circumstances um take into account what, what experiments need to be done and what doesn't need to be done so thank you for for noticing that too um i think uh, we touched on this a little but uh, you mentioned that you're already starting to like start to go back to lab and what that process looks like um can you maybe give some insight to people who don't know or aren't going back to lab yet um what kind of things that were had to be things about what type of bureaucracy did you have to go through so we are back in lab under strict rules of masks social distancing gloves hand washing hand sanitizing all of those things um the biggest issue that i'm running into is that i have second year grad students they're not completely self-sufficient yet and there's still things that i need to teach them in particular the stm just started working a few weeks ago however it's very hard to teach somebody something if you have to say six feet away um, and so i think that's one of the biggest things because now all of a sudden i have to be on the other side of the room and then like yell over like oh your synthesis didn't work why don't we tweak this 
or, um, you know, stand in the other room and be like, how's that lifetime coming along? Um, and so I think that's one of the frustrating things because mentoring and, and teaching in that way, it's, it's something where you have to be in close proximity and now we're not allowed to. And so it's, it's been interesting because Mentoring via Zoom or Slack or whatever is also just not the same as bonding in person and them to be able to come to my office and say, you know, something's not working or something's. So it, it's, it's been interesting, to say the least. <laughs> Yes, yeah, similar for us. So we are back, we are at forty percent capacity. So we take people start to take turns into the lab, and again with social, so making sure that the density of people is is low enough to keep the two meter distance, masks, gloves. But still, at least it gives some uh, energy because at least people can go back for a few days, and uh, so they feel a bit yeah better and. At least people can start to get out of their place and uh, take off the pajamas and uh, feel better. So yeah, but it's gradual, but it's already something in terms of better. So um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so in our place, um, so and in fact, in Illinois, uh, the situation is still pretty bad. Uh, so I'm not sure if we can uh, uh, go back, um, um, like in, probably until uh, May or end of uh, June. And uh, after we start reopen, uh, so we probably will have initially have only two lab members in lab uh, in our lab, uh, right? For at least the three, uh, two to three weeks, and we probably also will follow. There's actually a very interesting uh, video and uh, actually by uh, Yuri Alam from uh, uh, the Weizmann Institute. Um, so he put um, had a, a theory that he encouraged. Um, so he's the system biologist. So uh, what he proposed is that to work for lab members work for four days and then uh and then work from home for another 10 days so you have the two weeks period but uh, people only work for two days like on uh, street right street for four days and then stay at home for another 10 days and then you can just shift uh, so in that way probably the infection the rate of infection will be minimized so we can follow that in yeah but in short just run from very very slowly. It started with like two people in the lab, um, and then maybe by the end of July, uh, we can have uh, um, most people back to that part of this. I'm curious. I'm curious about that. Starting back up with two or so people. If you have a large lab, how do you determine who those first two people are? Is it just the folks that are graduating soonest, or is there like some sort of rotation pattern or yeah right so for example in, in my lab uh so one of my postdocs i mentioned his work on my talk so he's he's leaving uh to israel very soon because he's starting his own lab and he's leaving in early uh, uh july um so in june he probably will spend a lot of time in the lab just to, to finish off uh, some work yeah so that's the situation in my lab yeah that makes sense yeah. i could not that we, i could not uh, I could not be one choosing priorities because I thought everyone had the right uh, to get back. Uh, and how can I say, ah, you are more important than that one? So we just make turned, everyone is equal, uh, and uh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was just for them because, yeah, um, yeah. no priorities. Yeah, yeah, definitely some weird decisions that have to be made and things well, like that. Decision because, uh, of course, it, yeah, you can push uh, some projects instead of the other, but how do you do it? So, in the end, yeah, this was my approach. Yeah. So I think um, shifting gears a little bit again, um, you are all chosen not only because of your awesome science, but um, because you're awesome human beings who like to be engaged with the community and with your students. Um, so what what value do you see being engaged, you know, um, taking the time to do these team surveys or taking the time to be on Twitter and engaging with um, younger, younger, the younger generation of scientists. Um, what value do you see about it? And then also, do you have any tips for people that want to get started doing it, that want to be more engaged? Anyone can start. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I actually really enjoy it. All of the, the tweeting and um, the kitchen spectroscopy um, and whatnot. So, I mean, I was raised a bit uniquely. I was raised by two scientists. So that means my birthday parties included dry ice. Every now and then I had a few liters of liquid nitrogen to play with as a kid. Um, and that very much formed me to the person that I am now. But it also, you know, I had a chemistry kit when I was six or so. So all of these things were, were just normal to me as a child, but they were fun. So we would do science experiments in, in kindergarten or in, in school. And I feel like with, with what, what I'm doing here right now, whether it's the, the recent article that we published in Matter where we essentially just highlighted all of the things that glow in the kitchen, um, I feel that it can reach a generation that you know, can now grow up to be scientists. So I, I, I shared this article with friends of mine and then they sent me a video of uh, baking soda volcanoes outside with their you know, four-year-old, five-year-old children. And so I think this is a great way to essentially uh, inspire the next generation. And at the end, I feel like as scientists, as PIs, that's exactly what we should be doing. And so it's it's not work for me. Um, I run around giggling if I, uh, you know, find the next glowy thing at home. I, it's just fun. So. Yeah, actually to follow that up and then we can go back to um, Bozi and Rafa, but um, one person asked in the chat, how does kitchen spectroscopy work? I guess they want to do it at their own house um, and how, how is it set up? What do you need to do it? And they want to jump on and do it with you. Um, kitchen spectroscopy. Um, what you need is a black light and you can get those off of Amazon as mentioned for less than $10. And I don't shine it in your eyes, of course. Um, but apart from that, I pretty much just check what fluoresces around the house. We looked at a cucumber the other day. It turns red. Um, I basically, you know, and then you just take a picture and hashtag fluorescence Friday. <laughs> um, there's not much needed. It's just a black light. Cool. Um, well, uh, so, uh, can I add something? Like, yeah, of course. Come back to the, uh, the question you asked. Um, so I think in terms of the um, in, uh, uh, engagement in the um, in the community, I, oh, there are a few benefits, right? So of course it's, uh, it's good for science, and um, you uh, you discuss science, you learn from each other, right? So that, that's one thing uh, very obvious. And but I think there's equally important thing that is uh, through this. Um, process, um, you have built up this network. And this network is not just only for useful for yourself, it's actually useful for your, your lab members. Uh, for example, I have a few uh, postdocs who are uh, going to be on the market. And if I know someone or know some place that potentially can uh, have the specific position, and if I know this like upfront, that's probably uh, uh, can do something helpful uh, for my lab members. So I think in terms of network, it's not just uh, important for the PI, but also important for everyone in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, and they also do like the fact that we share that we are humans because uh, so we're not anymore that is uh, uh, crazy professors which lives on top of towers. But, uh, we are normal people with cats, with kids, with the uh, activity. With the, um, so I think it's also important to yeah to share with the uh, people inside academia and outside. As in, super nice what uh, Leah is doing with the with the with their activity to share yeah that we are people. So not only scientists. <laughs> yeah, I think following that point, um, just yeah, the whole idea that. Professors are human, postdocs yeah. are human, everybody is a human. Um, so that's really, um, really, really interesting. I think leads to the next question, um, which is how, how has you and your lab, how have you tried to stay connected? I know some people have like Zoom happy hours or, um, 
you know, I, I know with my previous lab, we go on WeChat all the time and send each other messages um, just to check in and be like, hi. Um, so I'm kind of curious how you maintain that human aspect with your own lab and with your own people. Yeah, Slack, 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 Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I've been making sure to check in on them just to make sure that they're doing okay as humans uh, fairly regularly. And um, we've been doing more Zoom meetings than usual. So you, we used to have one group meeting. We then started doing a group meeting in the beginning of the week and then towards the end of the week. Um, I also realized that sending a message isn't the same thing as talking. First of all, just giving them a call takes, you know, a fraction of the time. Um, and I've realized that sometimes if you message them, like, can you please do this? Um, the wording may be a bit ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And so we've, I mean, not wasted, but we've spent a lot of time misunderstanding each other. And then at some point we're just like, okay, phone call it is, let's figure this out. Um, because, it's just incredibly frustrating not being able to discuss it in person. And so Zoom's been pretty much the only way to do it. Um, but honestly, screen time gets exhausting. Yeah, so we, uh, we use Zoom. We also use the Microsoft Teams. And uh, in both platforms, we can um, have this video chat. And uh, one thing that I uh, really encourage my lab members to do is when we have this video chat, make sure that uh, you turn on the video uh, so that other people can see you. You can use a virtual background, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you, you show up your face, so at least other your lab members can see, uh, can see you, and uh, I can see you, and uh, it's, a, it's a good feeling. <laughs> I thought it was not a delicate situation. I mean, I did organize uh, these uh, Zoom uh, coffee breaks, but then uh, I didn't force people to attend because uh, maybe some people needed them. Maybe other people, no, because they had other things to do. So I think, uh, yeah, it's also, it's also not about forcing uh, interaction because, um, yeah, maybe, so it was also delicate on, uh, on, on that side, but still, uh, yeah, I try to offer possibilities and so that people could choose what uh, they wanted or what they needed in that moment. And it's true that then eventually we all learn about the Zoom fatigue and uh, everything that comes with it. And was uh, was interesting this reading where uh, uh, they were saying, ah, is imagine you are in the same place and in the same place you meet your friend, you meet your mom, you meet uh, your group, you meet, uh, uh, so it's like, uh, it's quite uh, a different situation. And also the other difficult things is that when you meet in a room, you, you look at someone and the person realizes that you're looking at them. He said on Zoom, no, you cannot, uh, if you, in big groups, it's difficult because, uh, yeah, you look at them, but actually they don't know that you're looking at them. So it's uh, interesting experiences. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, this question's a little bit more, um, not necessarily about um, COVID-19, but something really interesting that I think um, the audience picked up that all of your groups are highly interdisciplinary and they're doing a lot of different things. Um, so this person asked, um, they come from one disciplinary background and they're a little bit um, maybe nervous about being in a big group with other disciplinary backgrounds and how does that communication um how does that communication look like and maybe even during uh, covid 19 the communication is even different because as, as leah mentioned you can't you know explain something right in front of somebody um so how does that how does it look normally and how does it look maybe in this new normal Yeah, I guess normally it's easy because people just will meet for lunch or for a coffee or they share the lab. So, I mean, that's uh, you share a space and uh, you ask uh, your, uh, your uh, PI or you ask your colleague, how do you do this? And uh, you share more. It is more challenging. Uh, yeah, in this uh, new normal, I mean, Leah was describing one example, how do you 
how do you know if someone is doing things uh, what is doing right or wrong because you cannot approach the chemical food where they are doing the synthesis or uh, so yeah i guess i don't know we have to uh, it's going to be slower the the process the learning process might be slower because you are more isolated and science is also based on uh, interactions and uh, and yeah being close to each other and so it, um, so, um, in our case, um, I, yeah, so I, I certainly agree that uh, for for some aspects, right, for this interdisciplinary research, uh, uh, there might be uh, some delays. Um, but I think during this lockdown, because we have more time, we can actually read more papers. And uh, those papers, so what, what do we usually do in our lab is people share those documents, like latest publications. Um, and. And um, during this lockdown period, we actually spread, like, share more documents or papers uh, published in very different uh, fields, so other fields. Um, so we can have more time to actually dig deeper into this. Because sometimes, if we want to have a really good idea, especially doing interdisciplinary research, we cannot simply have a superficial understanding. We actually need to take some time and uh, look into the details and then identify those opportunities. And that takes time, right? So if you really want to know, understand what happens in that different food uh, that takes time and now this lockdown give us this time um, so I think uh, it could be good in certain way it may be um, not that great uh, in other aspects but uh, we're trying to push the good side <laughs> That's what we can do right now. yeah so I think um, without further really ado there's gonna be one last question and I think um, this will hopefully cover a couple of the um, questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, and I think there's there's two parts to this question. So the first part is, do you um, expect or how do you think this will impact students and postdocs? Um, there have been a number of hiring freezes. Um, there have been talks of some people, some students having to stay longer than their time originally. Um, so how do you expect this to impact students? Um, and then maybe um, after that, you can kind of comment on what you ideally will like students and postdocs to take away from this time. Um, I think that'll be a good way to end. So I think many students will be impacted in a certain way, um, whether it's the lack of bonding with their peers, whether it's the lack of face-to-face -face interaction, um, I don't expect my students to need any additional time because we were honestly in the lucky situation of having way too much data backlogged. So we've essentially been spending uh, quarantine <coughs> analyzing data and writing papers. Um, I understand that not everybody is this, in this lucky position, especially as a new lab. Um, but then, as Rafaela said, you write a review. Uh, you read, you learn how to use Illustrator or Blender and start, you know, these things, because all of this takes time. Mm -hmm. And these are things you can do and read papers and plan, you know, what you're going to do when you're coming back to lab. Um, so students will be impacted, but maybe, at least the graduate students, maybe not as much as our worst fears would be. Postdocs, on the other hand, I think I'm a bit worried. Uh, the funding situation is currently questionable. Hiring freezes are broadly announced. And the academic uh, you know, applications are already, it's, it's a stressful time and you need a lot of luck to even get a position. And now, cut the positions in half or even more, um, it's not looking good this year. And I'm really hoping that this will bounce back quickly because there's way too many talented postdocs out there that just may not get a chance this year. Um, so in my case, I'm worried about, you know, funding not being there because our economy is currently not where it could be. Um, Tenure clocks have been extended, so there's that. But time 
isn't money. And usually money is the important thing at the end that you actually need to move forward. So it's a difficult situation for everybody. However, everybody's doing their best. And uh, thankfully Um, my post got hired right before quarantine. So (laughs) all good. (laughs) Right, and so in our place, um, so in, indeed, there are um, uh, almost every day we we hear those neg- negative news about the free and the hair uh, freezing or um, um, a short of positions, right? Little things. So, I uh, for some of my posts, I, I just told, encourage them to start actually looking for a position in other countries um, that situation might be better. Um, so, that includes uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, right? Uh, uh, right. So, the other places, I think that will uh, probably give them some uh, options for that. And, and, and all, we also for students, right? So for students, I told them that now it's just the golden time for you to really look into things uh, that uh, are important, useful for your, for your career development. It's not just for your research. Research is, is one thing; it's a very important thing. But uh, given the time that we could spend right, on, on actual research, on um, the rest time, so instead of just a uh, uh, like. Uh, uh, spending less time like uh, reading uh, 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 some stories of like checking the uh, websites uh, that probably will not do anything good when you actually use this time to learn new skills, right? Those are the important because the, the situation, the current situation might be very bad, but uh, I think that as long as you, you improve yourself, uh, learn new skills, eventually they will and um, um, you can find a good, better job, right? Not necessarily in academia. You this is new skills that you learn in this period of time. And I also tell some of my students that it's actually not a, it's a good time to start to in some uh, 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 the leadership, right? So the leadership is not just uh, it's something that is important for for PIs, for professors. Uh, I think for post office students, they actually can start to learn this. Uh, many people, including myself, right? So I don't know what the actual meaning of leadership until I was like seven years, like essentially last year. Um, um, and I, I went to MIT for a bunch of leadership, and at that time point, I suddenly was. A lot of my understanding about leadership was completely wrong in the process. It's really not just uh, like being the top person. It's, it's not that. Um, it's more like, uh, like uh, how you, you support and communicate it with other people. There's a lot of other important aspects there. And if we think those things, I think for students, even for students and postdocs, uh, it's actually not a bad idea to uh, get them started. And um, I once told myself that if I attended that workshop earlier, Right, because I indeed made some mistake in the, my earlier career, right? So uh, I have to admit that. And I attended that uh, workshop and I realized that if I went to that workshop earlier, maybe I can uh, uh, minimize some mistakes that I made uh, uh, in, in my initial years. So I think for postdoc or students, senior graduate students, this is something very important. You, you need to know how how how. Uh, work with other people and support other people and this is uh, just important in, in anything yeah yeah that idea of supporting others i think that was really the vibe that all of you talked about today so i think that's uh, an awesome line to to end with really that we're just all here supporting each other we're all going through it and we're all human mm-hmm. um so on behalf of stacy um, and myself uh, both matter and i science so the journals that we work for we want to thank um bozi leah and Rafaela. Uh, you know we would give you a applause right now but we can't <laughs> but just imagine it you know? um, and we also thank everyone for tuning in and attending this webinar and we hope to stay in touch in the future um, and we hope that you all can come to the twitter after party um, so it's happening at one o'clock uh, eastern standard time so in an hour from now and we'll have um, some more perspectives from students postdocs scientists um, outside of academia um, right now um, so thank you so much and it was great having you so thanks bye. For having us. <laughs> bye. Very much. thank you thank you